everyone. Welcome to Writer's Realm Podcast, and thank you for joining us as we journey through writing together. We're your hosts, Bob Adato, Holly Rebilliard, and Austin Matthews. And today we're going to talk about writing your first chapter with Garrett Jones. Garrett, welcome. Hey, it's a pleasure to be on here. I yeah. really enjoy this. Sweet. Hey, tell us all about yourself. What do you do? Well, I am a kind of a jack of all trades, really. Um, I've got my hand into just about everything. Um, I'm a I'm a writer, published uh, indie author, and uh, a podcast host, uh, which I've been doing for a number of years. Um, as far as the writing, I have five books in an ongoing fantasy series called The Archives of a Sink Ran. Um, let's see if I can share the screen here. That's the wrong. <laughs> here we go. Um, so let me. Okay, that is not what I'm trying to do. Uh oh. Is everything is just oh. I'll try you click. <laughs> <laughs> so here are my books. Um the there's five so far in the series. Mm -hmm. The Heirs of Menonias, uh, which I spent about 15 years putting together from start to finish uh before wow. it, pub it went into publication. Um that came out in 2015. And then uh, uh about two years later, Destiny of Dragons came out. Uh, in 2017 uh, later that same year rise of the shadowkin uh, came out and then uh, a couple years after that hadron corvus of farfell which is book four and then just this last february so coming up on almost a year ago uh, the mantle of the fatherless book five in the series and it's kind of an ongoing thing um the, I'm, i start i have started work on book six but it's been kind of on hold since the summer okay fantasy series you want to give us like a synopsis um yeah, it's um, kind of like Game of Thrones, just not as graphic, kind of like Lord of the Rings, just not as much arbitrary walking. <laughs> but, I mean, I do love the walking journal of all the hobbits. It's just <laughs> so thrall enthralling. I mean, so. <laughs> dude, even the trees walked in those movies, man. Even the yeah. Trees walked. <laughs> yeah. And slowly. Yes, very slowly. Uh, and they, but they got way more that, done than Congress, so, that, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, it's basically your, your, your standard sword and sorcery, but I do a, mm -hmm. things a little bit differently. Like, uh, the characters all started off as comic book superheroes and villains that I was developing back in high school and middle school. And, uh, eventually I just hit this point where I realized that medieval fantasy was kind of the better fit for these characters with what I was doing, mm -hmm. and how I was developing them. Um, like the character right here, his name is Gavin. Uh, he's a uh, in the story. He starts off as as a ranger. He's just kind of roaming. He, he does whatever, and he's he's bonded with a dragon uh, called Nex. And initially, when I developed the character way back when, he was actually uh, a dragon themed vigilante, kind of akin to Batman meets Iron Man meets Green Ranger. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of the impetus for the character. And then eventually he just morphed into this, this ranger character bonded with an actual sentient dragon. And then when they fuse their, their essences together, they become what I call the dragon mist. It's this, this warrior, this um, kind of herald for the dragons. Cause in my series, the dragons are more or less a, an endangered species. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And then what is your podcast about? So um, I'm actually uh, I've done a couple of podcasts. The main one I have is my YouTube channel, uh, GKJ Publishing. I do a show called The Right Way where we talk uh, book recommendations, author interviews, and uh, creative writing tips. I'm actually in the midst of season six right now. Um, and um, so I've done more than 200 episodes uh, over the last few years. Uh, my 200th episode was a milestone episode that I had an interview with um, Jonathan Mayberry, if that name sounds familiar to anybody. He's done a lot of work for Marvel. He uh, did the novelization for Godzilla, King of the Monsters uh, in 2019, as well as um, he's got his own stuff out there. And he's just one of my favorite uh, sci-fi horror authors. Oh, um, and then... Um, but uh, most of the authors that I bring on are usually indie authors that I've connected with through social media, most of them on Instagram. Um, and it, it's been a lot of fun to kind of to connect with 
these other authors and, and build community and, and stuff like that. And uh, over the last couple of years, what I've done is I've had them uh, come back on as guest hosts to give me their recommended top 10 books uh, when they have an opportunity to present. Um, and because it, it saves me a lot of writing on having to do that every month. <laughs> for the new top 10 list. Um, and uh, I'll usually reserve like one or two months out of the season where I, I do something myself, usually audiobooks because that's what I'm listening to all the time. Um, and then the writing tips have varied from uh, a few different kinds of like we've done. So, I've done some very generic ones, but like uh, two years ago, I did the hero's journey. Last year, we were doing world building. And then this year, uh, this season, it's poetry, looking at how to write different forms of, of poetry, because it's I, I love poetry. I used to do songwriting in high school and college, and it just became kind of a thing for me. Uh, so I figured you know, break away from the fiction writing, mm -hmm. do something that's nonfiction. Yeah. And I mean, especially getting into like writing fantasy, I feel like it's, it's such a nice little thing to get to just put in there for a little bit of world building to have like, oh, hey, here's like either a whole poem or part of a poem that people can recite or something. Yeah. And, and Tolkien did that a lot with, mm -hmm. with, especially with Lord of the Rings. There's some stuff in The Hobbit as well, but uh, he included those elements because he did like poetry. He he thought all forms of literature should be included somehow, some way. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't have any of that really in, in my stuff. Um, but you know, because my, my rhymes are just kind of whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. Um, one of my stories that I'm working on follows a uh, basically a Viking shaman. And their poetry is just like so structured and difficult. Oh it's yeah, like next level obnoxious, but oh, I yeah. love it. Like, it, if you ever get a chance to read the prose edda, it is it is so beyond complicated how they structure that. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's funny. Hey, so I know you showed your uh, YouTube channel and everything. How can people find you? Well, uh, I'm on uh, Instagram and X. Uh, my my at is at gkj underscore publishing super easy um and then if you want to find me on youtube you just search gkj publishing it's all the branding's all there um really easy and then my website which i had for the books is archives of the five kingdoms.com um and it goes straight to the the website there's a landing page there which i actually need to update for january <laughs> i got a little bit swept up with the uh, the holidays but the uh i i do um, I put out a calendar of the events that I have coming up and stuff like that. So, okay. Okay. And then for our YouTube, um, actually for both, uh, podcasts and, and YouTube, I'll have all of his links down in our, um, little, uh, whatever uh, one, we have done there. One podcast <laughs> I did fail to mention a moment ago is I am actually a co-host on a star Wars podcast. Oh, I saw that. I've got a ton of, uh, star Wars stuff in the background. Um, yeah, I, it's called War of the Stars. Yeah. Oh, Bob's about to go on a tangent. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. We're gonna go down. And Orange we we sandwich. actually just recorded the, two episodes uh, yesterday for back to back. Um, that will be going out in the next uh, the, the end of this week and end of next week. And those mm -hmm. are covering our review of Caravan of Courage and the Battle for Endor. Ooh, sounds fun. Vintage He's, Star Wars. You mentioned novelization um, for for comics. That is something I try to get into. There's a comic uh, that I absolutely love. And of course, I can't remember the name of it. But I met the <laughs> artist and the author of it. And it's like a steampunk series. And mm -hmm. I was like, hey, would you consider? I would love to make a novelization of this. And they're like, nope. Uh, so I totally get it. It's their, it's their property. Um, but I would love to, I've, I've read so many Batman books and, um, other kinds of, uh, comic, you know, comic novelizations. It's just, it's yeah. really neat. So that's really cool. They have, they know somebody in the business. So I'll be trying to contact you later, but anyway, <laughs> all right. So we're getting into writing your first chapter. So easy. No, of course it was never easy for us. Um, I know I've heard so many different things about the um how you should start and what i always heard was your first sentence needs to hook your audience and here's something i did i went to a bookstore 
and I grabbed book uh, bestsellers off of the shelves and I was reading their first sentences and then I'm like, what the heck, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, Rebecca went to the beach and that was it. Like, what the heck am I doing? You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the caveat of course, being their bestsellers. So they no longer need to hook you. But for us, I mean, what's, what do you guys think about that? Is that true for indie authors or publish or, or what? I don't know. From my, my experience, it really is, is dependent on what's going on. So like my, my first book, it starts off with a prologue. It doesn't just start with chapter one. And the reason being is because the prologue sets up a bunch of this history because mm -hmm. uh, the title character Menonias is this warlord who exists like 250 years before the events of, of the rest of the series. And, um, I, it, I specifically use it as a way to kind of bridge a, a bunch of history uh, to prime the reader for what's to come. Um, and with that, I mean, I wanted to start off with something action packed, something that, um, that kind of just throws readers into the mix of it. And so when my chapter opened, like, and to be fair, when the prologue had gone, went through multiple iterations, um, uh, including an iteration that ended up making its way into a fire barrel. Um, <laughs> the, the what I finally came down to most prologues are only a couple of pages long. This prologue is about 12 pages, mm -hmm. uh, but because there's a lot of world building that goes into it, um, and it's necessary. But the, uh, the reason why I did that is because, uh, I had to boil a lot of stuff down into a few statements, but also get the bulk of this action sequence in place. And um, basically it's this last battle that Menonias and his forces are having. And he's in, he's in the midst of his keep uh, going up to the top tiers to see how bad the damage is. He's assessing all this damage and uh, a couple of mages show up to try and assassinate him. And it's all one big distraction. Yeah. Um and he ends up getting killed. But, like, it took me, like, seven or eight passes at this one chapter just to nail it to the point where it was good for publication. Okay, yeah. What yeah, do you guys I think, think? I think I really enjoy, um, I think Dan Wells talks about it being the, uh, the Ice Monster prologue. It's just, like, this action-packed thing that, like, introduces you to a lot of the lore, a lot of the promises for your story. But yeah, it's so great because it's like chapter one is going to be introducing you to the characters that are going to be going through it. So there's not going to be necessarily a whole ton of action unless they're like already important. And so, yeah, it's just so awesome to get to use a prologue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I love that as a jumping off point for my, I mean, I guess it's kind of your first chapter. It, it depends on, yeah, it's not chapter one, but it is your first chapter. Um, but I don't know about the first sentence being super, super crucial as far as like, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be the most quotable thing in the world or like the most eloquent thing in the world. Like as long as it's something that gets somebody to read sen sentence two, yeah. that's where you're on the right track. That's yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. I, I go, go for it, Holly. I was just going to say, I, um, I find the first few chapters of almost every book that I read to be incredibly boring. Um, and usually when I go to the bookstore now, I'll actually open it up to the middle and I'll start reading in the middle and which spoils it a little bit for me later, but it, it gives me like a really good flow. Cause I'm like, by the time you get to the middle of the book, things are happening. So the pace is, is pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so I can read through like a page or two in the middle of the book and be like, yeah, I'm going to like this yeah. because if it hasn't like, picked up by then, there's no hope for this book. Right. Yeah. And like, that's the hard thing is like, I used to tell myself, it's like, okay, you have to just sit down and start reading. And if you don't like it by page 50, you can put it down. Like there's so many things out there. I can't read page to page 50 on all these things to find out if I'm going to like it, mm. um, which is honestly why I'm a huge fan of spoilers. I, I don't <laughs> care. I will enjoy something more. It's like, you know, I saw some news about Critical Role, that something that happened in like episode 50. I was only on episode two and wasn't finding any motivation. <laughs> I was like, oh, I need to catch up. And so like <laughs> spoilers actually motivate me to like want to see how it plays out. That's funny. You're, you're kind of like a Greek audience there, Austin, because like the Greeks <laughs> would always want to have everything explained to them mm -hmm. right off the bat, and then they want to watch it all, you know, all those dominoes uh, hit the ground. Yeah. Well, and like the same thing is done in like Indiana Jones. So it's like, 
whenever you first meet him, he goes through a little miniature version of the entire rest of the movie. And so it's like, hey, here's a promise of what it's going to be, but we're going to go into more details. The stakes will be higher and they'll be way more awesome. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's kind of what you got to set up in, especially in a, in a prologue, if you're going to go that route. It's just nice. Like, here's a condensed version of what we're going to expand into. Mm. Now, can yeah. I be rude and say I don't read prologues? See, that is the <laughs> other thing I was going to say is that, like, if you have a forward, 99.9% .9 of I people will not read it. I don't read it. And if you, have a, if you have a prologue, probably, like, 70% of people that I know don't read prologues. I'm like, they don't? The book. I would think most yeah. people would. No, because people can conflate it with a, a forward. Like, it's not part of the story, and it's not uh -huh. important. Well, so. it is and it isn't. Like, mm -hmm. right. it, For if sure. the prologue is done well um, as, a, as a first chapter, the prologue can kind of set the, the scene for everything that's going to be coming. Like, for, like I said, for my book, the prologue I have in book, in book one is actually um, – it's, it's more of a short story that's mm -hmm. tied to it because otherwise Menonias doesn't physically show up in the rest of the series. Like you have like a spiritual essence that shows up in books two and three and, uh, and again in book five, but you don't physically see the character other than in that prologue. So that's the, yeah. the really the only interaction the audience has with the character. And so having that as kind of a, a short story to kind of segue into and introduce mm -hmm. all the other elements yeah. is very helpful. Yeah. And, um, and to be fair, it's like, if it's, it's super connected to your story, then it should just be chapter one. So it's like having it as it's like, it's an isolated thing that's kind of removed, but kind of but, important. You could take it or leave it, but, but I it's like hundreds it. of years. He said it's 250. So mm -hmm. that's usually what we see is like, mm -hmm. Like, say you just picked up um, Fellowship of the Ring, you start reading, there's no prologue in there. They're no. just, you know, um, you know, they just start with a party pretty much or, uh, you know, a, what was that? Uninvited party. I think that was the first chapter. But um, but in the movie, they did explain because it's thousands of years or a thousand years before all this happened, right? So I could, right. I could see both sides. But the a lot of the lore that pops up in or in the, the the prologue of the film is done in such a way to kind of recap elements of the Silmarillion as mm -hmm. well as elements of The Hobbit to kind of preface audiences who have never read any of the books right. and aren't familiar. All they know is, hey, this great fantasy series is coming out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they, they, they kind of condense it. But mm -hmm. um, like I think probably one of the worst prologues I've ever seen in a book um, – is in uh, the Meg uh, uh, by yeah. Steve Alton. I was just I, I listened to a lot of audiobooks as I mentioned, and last year the Meg was one of those. Um, and the prologue is actually it deals with the uh, like if you've seen the the more recent film in the Meg series, mm -hmm. that whole thing with the T Rex and the weird iguana things. That's mm -hmm. actually the opening for the first book in the series, mm -hmm. uh, which they almost duplicated what the Jurassic Park franchise has tried to do cinematically. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the but the prologue, it's great, but it doesn't serve much of a purpose other than show, oh yeah, this is a it's, it's a big badass shark. Great. Yeah. You get that through the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of kind of superfluous. Whereas like um there are some other prologues that I've I've read that are really strong and they help highlight something going on in the story that gets alluded to but it mm -hmm. doesn't you don't make that connection till the very end okay yeah well i think that's a good transition then to like talking about like what is the role then of the first chapter whether it's a prologue or you know an actual chapter one so like what are the goals that you set out with in your you know first chapter hmm. Hmm. well I introduce the protagonist right who's the story who am i rooting for right yeah. I like, I like from, for myself anyways, at least when I first started writing uh, my first book, I just like dove right away into the middle of a situation, like a high energy situation where um, someone was stalking another person. Um, so you automatically, you're opening this book and you have all this adrenaline going. And the second one that I wrote, I didn't do that. I had like a little bit of excitement, but it was more of like 
still the first chapter is explaining what's happening, but it wasn't as like high intensity and I liked it, but I almost preferred the way that I wrote the first one where it was like, you open it and like, bam, something's happening. Like you don't even have a chance to, to look mm-hmm. away because there's already stuff going on. Yeah. So you're, so you're to be hooked, right? You want to get hooked into that story, right? What do you get, yeah. Garrett? Well, I, for me, it, it depends really on the book that I'm, I'm reading or the book that I'm writing. Um, you know, like, um, uh, like Holly was saying, sometimes an action sequence is, is one of the things that's going to be best because it it just drops you right into the middle of the action. That's good with, you know, maybe sci-fi mill or, uh, you know, space opera or fantasy or, or, you know, just a good action thriller. But if you're doing something that where there's going to be a little bit more mystery, you want to use that first chapter, whether it's a prologue or you're actually going straight for chapter one, you want it to build some atmosphere, some level of intrigue. Uh, mm-hmm. that hooks the reader and so there there should be some level of hook but it doesn't necessarily have to be the wording of the first sentence exactly. because like i mean how many books have you guys read where you can actually recall the opening line of of a story the, there's only there's only one book that i know of besides the bible that that i can recall the first sentence and it's the, a tale of two cities mm-hmm. because it's been quoted mm-hmm. Ad nauseum. Yeah, that's the quote that everybody uses when talking about how important the first sentence is. That <laughs> and uh, what is it? The first sentence of Mistborn, Ash fell from the sky. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel yeah. like those are the two that I know. Mm-hmm. And those are the two that are used about how important the first sentence is. Like, I could maybe give you first paragraph. Like, if I'm bored through the first page, like, maybe <laughs> I'm not going to keep going anymore. There's millions of books out and, there. And I'm one of those readers where I am... Not so much with audiobooks. With audiobooks, I I will actually probably listen mm-hmm. all the way through, just because I'm a, I'm able to listen to what the story while I'm working, mm-hmm. um, but or while I'm driving or something, because that's how I usually am listening to something. Because if I'm at home, I'm usually in front of a TV or playing video games or whatever, <laughs> but or chasing a seven year old. Um, but the kid no, it's it, my kid let me phrase that i don't want to i don't want anybody blasting me on social media um, uh but uh when the lord of the rings books uh were uh, or when the movies were coming out one of my best friends is i call him my tolkien scholar because he like he knows just about as much as anybody could possibly know about J.R.R. Tolkien. Huh. Um, he was a, a pastor for a spell. And so like anytime he had an opportunity to somehow include Tolkien <laughs> lore into a sermon, he would inject it. Uh, even in daily conversation, it was great. Um, and because we would both nerd out about that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I know the lore just because I've read up on it. But honestly, the only book that Tolkien has re- uh, written that I've actually read all the way through is The Hobbit. I got all the way through the first chapter of Fellowship, and I had to put it down because I'm one of those readers that if the first chapter does not get me, book gets closed. Yeah. See, it's and it's so interesting because that's the thing is that like different things are going to hook different people. Because my favorite Tolkien book is The Silmarillion, and I'm a monster and I know it. But it's like if I don't like this story, there's another one three pages over. Like it's just so nice to be like, <laughs> I, it's all quick pace, it's all going. And like, yeah, it's a history book, but it's like, they're really cool stories or they're not. And I move on. Um, So yeah, it's just one of those things. Like, I think the thing that we've kind of all touched on though, is like setting the tone. Cause it's like, if it's an intensity, like high intensity thriller, then yeah, you need action packed beginning. Cause like, that's what I'm going to get. But if it's like action packed beginning and then no other action happens in the rest of the book, I'm going to feel like I've been hoodwinked. Like I'm going to be you know, you pulled the wool over my eyes and told me I was going to get this awesome thriller. And then it was like, oh, you know, I was just walking around looking for trees or something like what's going on. Yeah, I feel like it's really interesting, too, um, for the amount of pressure that writers put on that first sentence. How many people who write sequels, their second or third or fourth book takes place way after the end of the prior one because then you have like you have to rely on that first line again because you're starting a whole other story over um and i know we talked about this before but i recently read a series that when i opened the second book it literally started like as if it was just a continuation of the book from before and so there was no pressure on that first line there was no pressure on like the first Mm -hmm. chapter it's just continuing on and i was like this is amazing because we're starting like right in the thick of it right like you're right on that cliffhanger and off you go 
And I love that. I think I'm like, why don't we all do this all the time? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's actually the way I structured my series. Cause like book one ends on, on that cliffhanger book two literally picks up using the exact same uh, sequ sequence and, and phrasing and the same dialogue yes. at that very end. Um, and <laughs> so it picks up. And the reason being is because when I was doing my, my creative writing degree in college, uh, my focus was on comic literature, focusing on graphic mm. novels and the and the, the 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 serialized nature of the storytelling. I liked having that sequence where you can pick you could leave off on one part and pick up. But with books two and three, part of the reason why I had them come out concurrently within the same year is because the two stories actually happen concurrently. Where mm. book three starts off is actually in the middle of book two mm, and it picks up from a different character's perspective and follows that character. And so there are sequences uh, taken in both books that show the same scene, same dialogue, different POV. And I did that deliberately because I want, because I wanted to have that overlap. And then where book three leaves off is where book four picks up. Nice. All right. Yeah, and right. I think that's such a fun thing to explore, though, too, is, like, the way that perspective can completely change the same exact scene. It's like one person's reading all of the, the cues and things that are going on in one specific way, and then somebody else is like, oh, this is the exact opposite of what I thought was going on before. Yeah, it, it gives you that opportunity just to, to kind of infiltrate another character's perspective and 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 their lens because they're going to be completely approaching things from a different uh from a different angle like um you know uh, book two follows my my character gavin uh from the end of book one uh where he's left off going through this adventure by himself so it goes from being an ensemble cast to isolating just him and it's all his adventures moving forward but then there's another character that was introduced in book one named asher who is the main character of book three. And so he sees those same sequences from a different perspective. And so he's not coming from it from like the almost left for dead wounded hero character. He's coming out from someone who has been on the other side of that battle survived. And he's actually been looking out for his friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I like where we're going with this because one of the ideas for writing your first chapter well would be introducing your protagonist. Um, so like how far in do we do that? So my first chapter, I didn't introduce my main character until um, halfway through the chapter. And everyone thought the, the, the first person, the first character I introduced, which was right off the bat, was the main character. And then I killed him at the end of that chapter. Um, so people well, I mean, were, if you're writing a murder mystery, yeah, people were sort of tripping out like, whoa, you killed off your main character. Like, no, man, it's, you know, where I'm just kind of handing the, them off to the, you know, to the main character. But yeah, where, where would you write your, how would you introduce your protagonist uh, or where? It, it really depends on the structure of your story, I think, because um, one of the last books I read before the end of the year was... Uh, uh, Stuart Turton's uh, The Seven and a Half Deaths of uh, Evelyn uh, Hardcastle, which is a, it's a murder mystery uh, thriller. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like equal parts Agatha Christie meets Groundhog Day. Oh, mm -hmm. So your main character, you don't know what your main character's real name is. Everything is colored from from a first person perspective for that character, but it shifts because the character is hopping host bodies for eight days. Mm -hmm. So every day he's repeating the same sequence of events from a different POV. Uh, he recognizes who he is, but the longer he goes, he begins to lose himself in those host bodies and their perspectives uh, and their personalities. Um, and you don't really learn his real first name until like maybe a third of the way through the book. So if you can use that as if, like your, your writing mystery, explore that mystery mm -hmm. and on multiple levels. But if you're doing something that's, you know, pretty straight and narrow, you know, hero's journey type of thing, you know, you want to introduce your hero almost immediately. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because it's fun to play around with, like, um, whenever you're trying to, you know, push away from those, like, more set structures. So one of my favorite things to do is to introduce a character that you think is the protagonist, and then you switch perspectives a couple of chapters later, and you're like, wait, was that the protagonist or the antagonist? Because now from this other person's point of view, I can't tell. And it kind of just goes back and forth between the whole story. And you're like, they're both morally gray. They're against each other. I can't tell who's who. But like, you know, just exploring that. And But, you know, a lot of my work deals with, you know, the ambiguity of morality. So maybe that's just my thing. <laughs> and have, have any of you ever read anything by uh, Jonathan Stroud? Mm -mm. Uh, no. So Jonathan Stroud got really popular because of the Lockwood and Company series that mm. he put out that Netflix adapted it into a series. But my favorite books that he put out were the Bartimaeus books. Um, there's a trilogy that takes place in modern day, and it's kind of an urban fantasy. The fourth book in the series takes place during the height of King Solomon's reign in Israel. And uh, it's actually told from multiple perspectives. Um, you have Nathaniel, who is a very, in the first three books at least, Nathaniel is a, a young uh, up-and-coming magician uh, working his way through uh, the tiers of government in England. Um, but he summons this fourth level genie named Bartimaeus um, and the perspectives change because you get some of the same sequences just from different POVs. But when everything is written from a human character, it's all third person POV, very omniscient. Whereas mm. everything written from Bartimaeus's perspective is written first person. And the best part is there are footnotes. Anytime there's something that Bartimaeus cannot awesome. get to in his narrative, there's a little footnote. You drop down to the bottom of the page, and it's usually some kind of joke, some kind of a side, huh. very British in its humor, but it's it's it helps clue you into the larger world. Like Bartimaeus is there to kind of help ease the reader into the world of the jinn and, and the Afrits and all the other mm -hmm. spirits that you deal with. Hmm. And uh Whereas the human characters in introduce um, uh, how the humans are interacting with everything else. Mm -hmm. And so like there are like while you get chapter numbers, you don't get any chapter headings to give you an idea of what's coming up in that chapter. All you get is the name of the character that you're following. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really brilliant because it it gives you a very well-rounded grasp of the story. And some of those things may not necessarily be in chronological order because like with, with Bartimaeus, because he's used to being in this kind of this fluid space in his home dimension, his brain works in that same way where it's a very fluid space. And he will, like there are times where you'll be following his perspective and it will start with a memory of serving Ptolemy the Great or serving uh, King Solomon or serving some other major magician throughout history. Hmm. that's fascinating and i'm a huge fan of footnotes um <laughs> so uh actually the thing that i'm sharing with the our writing group right now uh has footnotes from one person and then as holly noticed i actually have end notes written by somebody else commenting <laughs> on the footnotes of that person that's awesome yeah so, it's yeah it's it's quirky and fun and it's one of those things like I am one of those people that like get stuck in world building and I'm world building so much and like I could spend chapters telling you about this or I could do one line in a footnote and move on with my life and you know it exists and I know it exists and we're all happy. <laughs> yeah. The nice thing about doing a series is you could do world building all throughout and build up. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's a good segue into world building. What's too much? What's too little? Personally, mm. When I start reading a book, I like to know the setting, running on grass, running through snow, running on the beach. That's fine. All running, though. Usually running. Running is the best for me. But um, oh, or cooking. Or, Forrest Gump. Yeah. At this point, <laughs> you just, that's, that's my favorite movie. You know, but, um, <laughs> but doing something, you know, real light world building for me. Like I honestly, oh, so here's a great example. I read, um, who wrote um, 007? Ian Fleming. Thank you. Ian Fleming, his first book, uh, was it Dr. No? No, from our show. No, it was Casino Royale. His Dr. first no, book? Actually, yeah, the first book is, because I've actually have been reading through them in, in ah. sequence. And uh, Dr. No was actually the sixth book in the series. 
from Russia with love. That's the one I wrote. I read. Okay. So neither one, but I thought that was his first one, but this guy went through a, easily a page and a half describing the backyard pool area. Mm -hmm. And it was ridiculous. Like that was way too much. Like I could care less. I actually just said, okay, where's this guy? Where's the dialogue? Because I'm done, you know, when I'm wondering about the, the hedge trim and the grass blades and the, it's just, so anyway, world building. One of the things I, uh, going off of that, one of the things I like about uh, Ian Fleming is that he's really good at setting the scene, giving you all these minute details. And the reason why it it seems, I mean, for if you're reading through it, it it feels really mundane, really, really dry. That's kind of how dry. I was when I was reading chapter one of Fellowship because mm. Tolkien spent, you know, an entire chapter following a blade of grass. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even been introduced to Tom Bombadil yet. Um, <laughs> Don't even get me started on how much I love Tom Bombadil. <laughs> the reason why he spends all this time setting the scene, especially like in a story like From Russia with Love, is because he's introducing that uh, that turncoat Irish guy mm -hmm. who's the who's a, a Russian assassin, right? Yeah. Or Smersh, and the and he's setting it up because. This guy's living in this beautiful part of it the was Ukraine. beautiful. Yeah. And you know, he it, everything that's been lavished upon him is still while it while it's his to use and and, and operate with, it is owned by the state. Mm. He is at the behest of the state and sure. he is essentially just their 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 dog. Right. Uh, mm. He's okay with that because they get to cut him loose and he gets to do what he enjoys doing, which is killing people. But you get this, uh, this, all this luxury is simply to help you as the reader understand that this guy is in prison mm. because this is the only way that they can trust him to do what they want him to do. Mm. That's the way of putting it. Which is, whereas when you start looking at the way that uh, Bond is preparing himself for, uh, for maybe a part of the mission that he's on like mm -hmm. for example dr no like he's not he doesn't go to the caribbean to actually go on a mission he's assigned to investigate the death of uh, a chief head there mm -hmm. and and simply gather intel he's not supposed to even be looking at dr no at all and that's just where the investigation leads him right he makes connections with people he's already been introduced to in earlier books and from there he begins preparing his body because Dr. No comes right after from Russia with love where it ends on the bit, one of the biggest cliffhangers of all does James Bond die? Yes mm -hmm. or no. Cause he's poisoned at the end of that one. Yeah. And then it takes place six or seven months later and he's having, he's having to re-strengthen his body all over again after being poisoned with tetrodotoxin. Hmm. Okay. So world building uh, can be important. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it should be important if you're putting it in there. Mm. And like, that's the thing is, is like, you know, something like that where it's like, it serves a clear purpose, but like, you know, that was the thing is like, I always had a hard time in school. It's like, we'd read Dickens followed by Melville. And I'm like, I'm having such a hard time with this because it's one, it's so far removed from my life. And so it's like, it's, it's useful to get that intro into it in the same way that with Tolkien, it's like, these things are so removed from my life that you can take something fantastic and make it feel mundane by almost beating it to death where it's like, this is just the world they're in. So like, I can almost see it, you know, serving a different purpose, you know, in a Tolkien thing where it's like, I'm going to lower this all down. It's all normal. The magic and the leaves of the normal trees are all described in kind of a similar way, a very fanciful way. Um, but like, you know, you have learning curves in particular with fantasy novels where it's like you've got something like Sanderson where it's like, oh, I'm going to introduce you to three new magic systems and the whole plot surrounds on how they interact with one another. And so, you know, you just got to really be careful with how you meet that out. But in the same way, if I published something that had the same learning curve as a Sanderson novel, people would put it down. But they trust Sanderson because he's an established author. And in the same way, we have to understand, like, if people are getting to know us at the same time they're getting to know our characters we don't have that level of trust necessarily to be like, this is all going to pay off. Well, not necessarily. And, and here, here's why I say this is because the, if, especially if you're building something in like a sci-fi or a fantasy world where mm -hmm. it's far flung from what we know in the real, um, it helps when you see the characters interacting with yes. that. 
because the, the world building is as much a character as the yes. people populating it. Um, I just I just mean that you have to be careful how quickly you throw it at people. Right, right. you don't want to thrust everybody in. Just, yeah. just you don't want to you don't want to info dump or anything like that. You want to you want to carefully scaffold everything so it makes sense while seeing the characters interact. But one of the things that is really interesting is like if um, are you guys familiar with uh, Will Jordan, the critical drinker? Mm -mm. He's, no. he's on YouTube. Uh, he actually just did a. Uh, he, he I, he's one of the YouTubers that I've been following for the last couple of years. He's got a really interesting take on, on uh, uh, movies and cinema and, and storytelling and all that. And um, he, he's really, really harsh. I mean, he's Scottish. He drinks, the, you know, that's what he does. <laughs> but the, um, he, I read his first book. He's got a series of, of, of thriller novels. Um, and I read the first one on there and, while it takes place in the modern world uh, in in something that we can easily grasp within like the, the espionage spy military lifestyle mm -hmm. that for anybody who's never been around military or you have a very limited idea of it, there is world building in that because uh, to understand where these other soldiers come from as far as their different walks of life, um is di I'm like and if you're from the united states our concept of of military is going to be different from say the how the british do things uh, because if we if we don't know the different terminologies you know that world building isn't going to be as uh easy for us to grasp because i mean we think mi6 great that's the big spy agency but like there's like various levels of of the ministry of intelligence mi5 is like the fbi mi6 is like the cia or in nsa for us mm -hmm. and so there's just different levels of how that mm -hmm. plays out um and you you see that like even within different branches of military because like you know people who don't know what they're talking about when they're writing something that's military adjacent like if you had people who weren't consulting on say top gun uh mm -hmm. you know they didn't know the different ranks and how things work in in the navy they're just going to start throwing stuff out there and it doesn't make any any sense whatsoever, if, especially if you're dealing with, like, say, the Marines or the Army or the Air Force or the Coast Guard. It's going to be completely different. So there is some level of world building in that as well. Mm -hmm. I Actually, if, I just want to say really quick. Oh, no, it, makes, it makes me absolutely crazy. I see this all the time in movies when they have, like, these guys that are in their um, uniform and they're sitting in a bar having a drink. I'm like... That does not happen. That is so against the rules. And it's like every military movie or show that I see, there's like some guy, you know, in his full uniform at the bar, hanging out and having cocktails. And I'm like, that's a no, no. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm sorry. Like, My work would be upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, uh, maybe that's why we write fantasy, right? So that we don't, we're not oh, constrained, man. you know. You say that, but you know how many times I've had to do research on how far you can force march a horse in like <laughs> certain weather through certain terrain. Wow. Like, okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have like measurements of like, this is how far my cities are apart. This is, you know, how far. It's like if they force march, you can make it there in like five days. So, yeah, it's interesting. So, mm. it's part yeah. of the problem of like doing things that are like the whole thing of like write what you know. And it's like, well, you can. Obviously, I'm a fantasy author. I'm not writing what I know, but I have to know what I'm writing. And so I have to do a lot of research for those kind of things. One of the ways that I got around that, especially with distances, because distances is a, is a huge thing. You know, as American authors, do do we use do we use some kind of metric system? Do we use the English system, Imperial? What, what are we going to use for how how are we going to do distances? So what yeah. what I do is I use I use uh, measurements based like I don't use like hours or anything like that. I don't have actual mechanical clocks. I'll say something like, you know, it happened, you know, around noon or around the late afternoon. I use mm -hmm. times of day. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like if I'm describing characters based on height, uh, I'll describe like the character who is a head taller than the mm -hmm. main character mm -hmm. or yeah. head shorter or, you know, sh broader shoulders or something like that. Uh, yeah. If it's, if it's distance at that point, then it's like, it's, half a day's journey or a day based based on a length of time of sun up to sundown hmm. yeah and Which i think is really good can... too oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that's better as well especially when it is something like height or something like that because i don't want to read a book and someone be like oh they're five foot nine 
Cause that to me is like weird. Like what, you know, you wouldn't ever introduce a person like, Oh, this is my friend, Bob. And he's six foot one or, you know, four foot two. Like you would never describe someone in, in yeah. real life like that. So I why mean, would you describe four foot a character? Two, <laughs> that is kind of remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> but you so, know, like it's, you would say like, you know, he's abnormally short for a man or there you go. something yeah, like that. Like you, yeah. I've heard that. I will say that like, I do have actual measurements in my world and it's like, I might think of it in my, like, mine is like, oh, he's six foot two, but six foot two in this world is not necessarily six foot two in this other one. Yeah. Because there's not like a standardized unit of measurement because like a foot was originally based off of something. It was based off of what, like the measurements of a king or something. And then like, yeah. eventually they're like, okay, we're not changing it anymore. Um, well, so it's it's just... then like, if you're writing something in, in science fiction and you're, bi and you're talking about weight, weight is simply based off of, of gravity and how it affects it so if you're on a planet that has like a lower gravity level you're not going to weigh the same i mean i'm mm -hmm. i'm 220 pounds on a you know on a good day yeah so you're just going to be measuring the mass instead of the weight yeah and uh it's fascinating. but if i'm on mars i'm i'm going to be maybe a few pounds lighter because the gravity is just slightly less than earth mm. whereas if i go to say gosh uranus where it's where the, there's very little to no gravity, I'm just gonna be floating around like, like <laughs> like you know like a bird. Yeah. Now I will say just to bring it back, all of these systems probably don't need to get brought up in the first chapter, other than to be like no. what you were saying is like oh yeah he lived like half a day's journey from you know the sitter the city center yeah. like you those kind of out. things exactly. If you renamed all the chemical elements, please don't drop that in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you have all that dumped on you in the beginning, it pulls you out, right? Because then you're like, okay, you got 10 pages in, now I know the world. And then you're like, oh, okay, now is the story going to start? And that's so <laughs> distracting, right? Yeah. Like it, you're trying to force me to be in the story and I don't want to be forced to be in the story. I want to want to be there. And so I want you to slowly like leave, leave it a little bit, leave some cookie crumbs. I want to learn the world at the same time as learning the characters. And that's mm -hmm. the whole thing purpose of world building is because it helps develop your characters it helps develop your plot so if you're just throwing it all in the first chapter just so people know where they are it just doesn't make sense it's yeah. taking away from some really good qualities in your story absolutely yeah i think that's a good segue into our last point here making the reader care like why am i reading this book right uh, hopefully we've introduced the your protagonists and we're we want to root for them hopefully right away at some point in the, in the chapter, but there should be a reason why, like Garrett, you mentioned, you read the fellowship of the ring. You couldn't get past the first chapter. Like there's something that didn't resonate with you. And I think that's going to be the case probably no matter what there's, we're probably going to get people yeah. that just put our books down yeah, um, and they're all dumb. But anyway, no, I, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'm going to edit that out probably, but I, I uh, people tell me my book's unreadable. Yeah, yeah, you just, you know, you run to these people, but we want to give a reason why, you know, we, we're, we're still there, right? Yeah. So what would that look like, making the reader care? I, I think giving them something to root for is very helpful, uh, especially if, I mean, if, if you're the kind of person who writes... Uh, fantasy you want you want them to care about what the heroes are going to go through what they have to fight for uh, whether they're whether they're the actual good guy or they're just the bad guy who thinks they're the good guy mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're writing something that's a mystery you want to uncover the the truth of what's going on um, there is a, a book that I, I helped publish last year um, called Jane Doe. It's written by Kay Griffin Peterson. And the initially I was going to pass on it um, as, as the, the per, as the, as the publisher. And the, the, what stuck out to me is that um, there is this, this underlying mystery as weird as, as the whole thing gets. And it's, it does get a little weird. Um, what sticks is the fact that these the characters are in this together trying to uncover what is going on and that's what makes the audience care that's what makes the reader care um 
and Kay is, has shared some of the responses that she has gotten from uh, from readers who have reviewed it and whether it was their cup of tea or not, they uh, they had some good things to say in that they cared about the mystery. Mm-hmm. And so whatever genre that you're writing in, if if you can get the reader to either connect with the characters because of a, a united goal or because of um, there's an emotional connection there that they can that they can identify, then you've done your job as the author. What do you have, Holly? Anything? I yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like absorb all of this. Right. Too. Yeah. No, this is good um, stuff. Like, I'm not going to go back and listen to us 50 more times. But, anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's so important that they have something that they can grab onto that they actually resonate with because there's no way you're going to keep somebody involved in your story. I don't want to turn the page if nothing really happens in the first chapter. And so, for me, it really comes back to that whole creating a problem, hmm. um, making sure that you're telling me what the problem is. Because if I don't know what the problem is, it's not like, oh, I don't know what the problem is. I'm going to read the next chapter to find out. Like, mm-hmm. that's not what's going to happen, right? It's going to be like, well, nothing's really happening. There's not really a problem. I don't really care where this goes. Um, so I feel like the two actually kind of go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. But that, you know, you have to have a problem and it has to be good enough that I'm like, oh, well, what if what if that doesn't work out? Or what if you can't find a solution for it? Or that's a big enough problem that it's probably going to be very hard to find a solution for mm-hmm. um those are good points and so I, yeah i just i feel like it, they they kind of just go hand in hand yeah. yeah i would say for me like if i don't care about the like it's not necessarily the story that i have to care about i have to care about the main character that you've presented in that chapter so like if you have like a cookie cutter like itself like or like you're supposed to insert it as a reader where it's like it's bland enough that anybody can see themselves in it like i don't like that i want a character that's like unique enough that i'm like oh that's not me but i like this person i can be friends with this person or like i want to see what happens to this person so i think i love a strong voice for whether it's you know first person or third person or you know second person if you want to go there um that's the things that i love is like that strong personalization of that character the characterization um so so like what Garrett said, an emotional connection? Yeah, yeah. Just giving me, like, hit me in the feels, like, right away. Just give me something that's going to, like, want me to want it resolved. Um, mm-hmm. Whether it's, like, something bad happens in the first chapter or, like, they're thinking about something that happened, they're reminded of something from their past or a hope for the future. Um, so, like, you don't have to, you know, kill off all of, you know, Luke Skywalker's family in the first chapter, but you had to show that he wants something more. Mm-hmm. And then you can twist it on me and be like, oh, that thing that you wanted betrayed you. Mm. Like, that's that's cool. Because it's like you set up one thing and then you twist it and make me feel all the more because I wanted that for him. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, that's the thing that hurts. Well, I think what's interesting though is like jumping back into Star Wars, and I know that Bob's going to be completely happy about this, <laughs> but think about the first character that's ever been introduced in Star Wars. Hmm. Who's the first character that show, that shows up by name? R two D two. No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Well, Darth Vader. Vader. Yeah. Darth Vader. Everybody, my main and guy. So my big moment, guy. <laughs> the moment he shows up he on is. screen, you automatically know that there's something dangerous. There's something threatening mm-hmm. about him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we get the prologue at the beginning with the with the the rolling text, at giving us this idea of okay, rebels versus empire, but we don't know to what extent why are the rebels rebelling in the first place and then when we i mean sure it's about the plans for the death star great okay big whoop how menacing is this empire so when you when you see them in this much larger ship overtaking uh, uh, the rebels uh and then the boarding party shows up destroys everything in sight and the next thing you see is this dark shadow coming out of the the smoke says nothing and just tromps through the the you know the the casualties of war without even i mean you can't see him blink but literally without (laughs) blinking you know that there's something very serious about this character and he becomes this character that you're intrigued by 
but you want to hate because you know he's the bad guy. But mm-hmm. then it t- come to find out later on, Vader's not even the bad guy. Yeah, he's the bad guy. <laughs> he's not the bad guy. Yeah, Arkin like the is henchman. the real bad guy. Yeah, Arkin is the real antagonist of the story. Right, and he's a complete jerk. Like <laughs> until I met Joffrey Baratheon, I hated Grand. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Holly, what were you going to say? You were going to say something? Um, yeah, I was, but now I'm thinking I might just have to save it for my don't. Okay, don't. <laughs> we're at that time of the show where we go through our don'ts list. Here's what not to do when writing your first chapter. Anybody would like to go first? I'll go. I will okay. go. <laughs> um, yeah, so going back to what we said about making sure that you um, introduce your problem, don't be afraid to not introduce your problem in the first chapter, which Mm -hmm. sounds absolutely crazy after everything that I just said. However, (laughs) I say this because it's okay to do it if you're introducing a smaller problem that is also going to play into the plot. So for me, when I'm, I've been working on Heartbound and I, the problem that I introduce at the very, very beginning in the first chapter, which seems like this is probably what the whole book is going to be about is something that plays into the actual problem. So the, big problem that is going on the thing that kind of helps develop all of my characters the thing that takes the whole thing all the way to the end comes up like oh god like 10 15 chapters in but this mini problem plays a big enough role that it's going to carry you through it keeps you interested until you get to that problem and then once you get to that big problem you're like oh shit like there's (laughs) there's more it's not just this it gets so much worse yeah um It's a relay so, yeah. race of problems. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what keeps it going, right? It keeps building up that tension when you create, if you just have one problem and you introduce it in your first chapter and then you're like, this is the problem all the way to the end, you know, it, you're missing out on an opportunity to build tension. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. don't be afraid to just twist it up a little bit. Good. Who's next? And then I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, so Garrett was talking about earlier, like people may not go on because they see like, oh, it's not their cup of tea. Well, I'm going to say, don't be afraid to show your cup of tea. Like I am Earl Grey with a little bit of milk in it and some sugar, and that's okay. And if you don't like that, move on to another book. You're not going to like my book. And so let's save our boat. Like you can save me the bad review. I'll save you the time of reading my whole book. (laughs) And so let's just like give them a flavor of what it's going to be and like be very upfront about it. And so like I write you know, high fantasy. So like I make sure that I introduce, I have some things that look sci-fi, but I want to make sure I got a prologue that's like, hey, these these weird creatures doing magic. So don't worry whenever two thirds of the way through the book, magic shows back up in my sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say my don't is uh, don't write for anybody else but yourself. Mm. Because ultimately, if this is the story that you're wanting to tell. Like, when I had my first book come out, I, I mean, I wrote that for me. That was the whole point, getting out there. And the f- one of the first uh, first people to read it was my aunt. Uh, and she liked the story. She thought it was good. But her biggest comment to me was, don't do so many uh, specialized words. You know, st- drop the, the, the letters with the accent marks. Uh, it's hard to read. No one can pronounce them, even if you give them a pronunciation guide. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, 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 turned, I, I turned into the skit and I did more of it. Because that's usually how I am. I'm the person who, who oh, like, yeah? will give me an ultimatum. I will be like, okay, I'll call your bluff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I turned into the skit on that. And, and you know, most people don't have a problem with it. Um uh, my dad has read through all five of my books. The biggest issue that he had is that he didn't see the direction of where things were going. But the problem is he, he, he had been so far removed from the first four books in the series that whatever mm. uh, connections there were leading into it all, because everything for me is consequential. Um, so like the things that happen in book one carry over to later entries in the series. You may not get that, that culmination until much later. Um, very much like in a graphic novel or comic series. And uh, so because of how many years it had been since book four had come out, he had forgotten a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so going into it and, and reading this book that takes place 20 years after the events of book four, it threw him for a loop and 
he wasn't really sure where the connection was and where it was going to go. And he's like, you should have had this come sooner. I'm like, well, that's not the story I wrote. Hmm. Sit down, shut up, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I have a lot of, I have, I'm fortunate enough that I have quite a few friends that do read um, the kind of stuff that I'm writing, um, which is like adult fantasy. And I also have a lot of family members who love to read who do not want anything to do with fantasy. And it's really funny because they're all like, oh yeah, like we'll buy your book, but you know, I'm fr- and I'll read it. And I'm like, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're just not going to enjoy it at all. Like, right. yeah, <laughs> like I might be a terrible writer for you and you might think this book is awful, so, <laughs> you know, because you just don't read it and you, you know, you don't like that kind of stuff. So, you know, yeah. And it's okay. And that's like, okay. <laughs> not every writer is going to be your favorite and you're not going to be everybody's favorite writer. That's right. So. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, my don't would be, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, would be don't, um, like either, if you introduce your problem in the first chapter, don't meet that problem. Don't reach that goal by the end of that chapter. Um, I have, I've read like beta read a couple of stories from people and I saw this, you know, it was one of those, oh, uh, he woke up sad and, uh, there's this uh, river that my dad used to take me to before he died. And, um, I'm going to do everything I can to, to get there. And by the end of the chapter, which was like three pages or four pages, he's there at the river and I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, is this a short story? Like we, we want a reason to keep going, you know, yeah. Reaching, you know, you, you have all these obstacles. We didn't really talk about this, you know, with the problem and, uh, reaching their goals, but there should be a plethora of, um, obstacles to get through for your protagonist to, to reach, you know, whether it's saving the world, saving the galaxy, or just getting, you know, that special one ring that everyone's talking about, <laughs> but, um, so don't. You know what I mean? Like, don't wrap it up in your first chapter. Don't solve all your problems in the first chapter. Introduce you problems, and then let's just keep turning the page to get there. Bob, can I add a caveat on that? Caveat, go for it. So I would say if you do wrap up what seems to be the, that seems, and that's the word I'm using, that's the key word there, that seems to be the big problem, make whatever comes next worse. There you go. Because one of the things that's going to do is it's going to give your your reader some uh, this idea of, okay, I can breathe easy now. It's going to be all downhill from here, even though it's the beginning of the story. But then you've got something much worse looming Mm -hmm. and it ratchets up that tension in the storytelling because then it raises those stakes exponentially. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. I feel like if you are trying to get to the river, then you get to the river. Someone needs to drown in that river by the end of this yeah. chapter. <laughs> you know, his father quickly. Dead like, <laughs> in the river. No, well, I don't know. Something well, it's, like it's, that. Uh, Holly's right, though. Like it's it's mm-hmm. the um, the idea of uh, Chekhov's gun. So if you introduce something into the story, it needs to happen, or it needs to be culminated by the end of that story, especially if it's a key element, um, and. But the other factor is, uh, uh, it was uh, Hitchcock when he talks about the the bomb in the in the uh, in the table. Uh, he's he's sitting there talking about like if you sh- if you if the characters don't know there's a bomb and the audience doesn't know that there's a bomb, there's no tension there. Yeah. But if the audience knows there's something there because they see someone place the bomb and hide it inside that table, and you have other characters who don't know about it at all. And they're moving around. They're almost opening the table and, get, and looking in there. It ratchets up that tension because you don't know what's going to trigger it. You don't know when it's going to go off. Will it go off? Is it a dud? That tension just progressively gets worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, somebody else put it like uh, you reach a, like a goal or the end of the, the, you get to the end of the chapter. And, uh, you know, like he gets to the river and then... You know, and then some, or, but something else occurred. So that's pretty much, I'm just reiterating what everyone else is talking about so that there's a reason to keep moving uh, on to the next page. Yeah. That's the thing is don't abandon the reason to keep moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one more time, Garrett, how can our listeners find you? 
Well, you guys can find me on uh, on social media. I'm on X and Instagram at GKJ underscore publishing. Uh, you can find my website, the archives of the five kingdoms dot com, um, where it, landing page. It's a full uh, companion site for my book. So all the maps uh, uh, and back content is all there available for free online, including character That's profiles and, and stuff like that. And then um, you can connect with me on YouTube at GKJ Publishing. My show is called The Right Way. And uh, but if you just search GKJ Publishing, I'll pop I'll pop up. And then um, I'm on a Star Wars podcast called War of the Stars. Uh, we are on Geek News Now. So if you go to uh, geeknewsnow.podbean.com, Spotify, we're all we're all over the place with that. All right. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to give that a listen. That sounds fun. Mm -hmm. um garrett we had a blast with you like you're just so intelligent you're so knowledgeable so well read uh you read books you're like oh have you heard about this and we're just looking at each other like i don't even know <laughs> i have my collection of fourth grade books right over here but uh anyway well you you can't see it because i've got my 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 outer space background right, right over here behind me is my bookshelf it's nothing but graphic novels oh fun Wow. Uh, and most of them I got during college because I convinced my dad that I could use them as textbooks. <laughs> major, <laughs> and we were able to write off like three years worth of, of borders purchases uh, nice. as textbook purchases. Awesome. Nice. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. It was great. Um, yeah, my college actually has a class uh, on the American superhero. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, it's just comics. They've got like three or four different ones. And it's like, just it counts as a history credit. Yeah. Fun. Great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it was a blast for me. I thank you for having me on. Um, I'm willing to be on again if you ever need me. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> You're great. Yeah. We, and I know our listeners would have had a great time uh, learning from you. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. do check out my creator's corner playlist on, on my YouTube channel, because um, if there's something you guys are working through, I've got stuff on there. So. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. All right, so don't forget to write and describe to our channels at the links below so you don't miss any of the Writer's Realm content. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have a question or a topic or uh, an author or someone you want us to uh, interview or dive into, get in touch. Uh, until next time, we will talk to you later. Bye. Bye, y'all.